Right, I'll make a declaration now. I'm very old, so I've got reading glasses. You are just a fuzz because I need to read them. But if I ignore you, it's, that's all that's I'm very good at. Um, yeah, that's me. This is about risk judgment and mitigation. It needs very nicely to be the other. It's almost as if it was planned. No, no, not at all. I always forget to say thank you. But thank you to everyone on the organisers, Jeff. Nancy, you always said it, so actually that's what I always come to the end and forget that I've said that people say that. Or oh, Robert Martina. Ah, I said that. This is me, SSTC, my company. Uh, we wrote a book, the user group, these are the various presentations. Uh, so, in my experience, and I've been around the a few times, this is how I see a lot of projects run. This is how I run a lot of my projects. Is I have my target and I just go uh, walking through it. And there are risks and I just hope for this. I accept them. Which is one technique of risk management. I can do attitude. We all like a can do attitude, don't we? Go and get it. Uh, so, here you go. If you build an embedded system, this one bit me on the ass, not recently. Build an embedded system, how much time do you attach in your quote or in your time or in your project to deploy it? Do you assume that your deployment is going to be successful when you do that quote? If a customer gives you some hardware, do you quote based on what they're doing? Not gonna ask me. What if it doesn't? That fits up in it, not I? Okay, so, yeah, I could play the betting game here. I've got 170 odd people. I'll bet you that your projects are gonna fail. You're gonna not deliver what the customer wants when the customer wants it. I'll bet you that. And the reason I know that is because 80% of the projects fail. So I'll make money to the casino again. This is a very useful graph. Take it away with you because it talks about a probability of occurrence. It's one to keep on using. Probability of occurrence and delivery time. <laughs> so what you have here is this is your time building the project. And this is the first point you have the ability to deliver it. It's called the nano change position. We have a nano percent chance of delivery on the stuff. <laughs> this is the average sign, this is, and it gets longer as it goes out. Now, we tend to get asked to quote, what is the earliest time that we can deliver the project? Well, that's the nano time, when you have a nano percent chance of delivery. You shouldn't, you should go, uh, look, this point here, I've got a 50% chance of delivering in this time. That's probably a better place to quote. So risk management is project management for adults. We're all adults. And that means taking on some harsh trips. Uncomfortable trips. Uh, so talking about the can-do thing, you've got to manage it. You're great. You're the best programmer in the world. You can get this done on this impossible time scale. It's still an impossible time scale. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So one other way of risk management is to avoid risk. They're running away from it. You can do that. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you should always wear a shirt. Because click on the don't do t shirts. Hold on. Hello. Oh, okay. So this lady here, Helen Keller, says this very nice statement, which is security is mostly a superstition, but life is either a daring adventure or nothing. All good things come from risk. By risk management, I don't mean avoid risk. I mean manage it. 
So what, you're, what you're saying is don't use encryption. <laughs> just, just, if I look at my history, <laughs> all the things that I really remember and I really enjoy are things that, uh, let's say, I've crossed a boundary or two. <laughs> so, managing risk. This is the goal of this presentation, to talk about managing risk, to get people to think not about the earlier state. Increased awareness of enforcement and risk management in a project process as well. Um, so, I'll, I'll bash on again a bit about the avoiding risk. It's a stagnant technique. Really, you're better off blindly walking into it. So, here's a real life example. So this is a very famous case study. So Denver Airport Handling System is recognised as, as a symbol of incompetent software projects. We get bashed over the head of this. Ah, software is crap. I'll ask a few simple questions. So why couldn't the airport open without the baggage handling system software working? So the baggage, but what happened was they couldn't, the baggage handling software didn't work, they couldn't open the airport, the airport was closed until it was working, which was nuts. It was, and it cost half a billion pounds. It being closed and stuff. So, why couldn't the airport open without the baggage handling system? So well, the baggage handling software was the overall project's critical part for the airport's opening. It was so essential to the airport operation that the members of the organisational governing board knew they couldn't move passengers through the airport even for a single day without the system. Quite a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, they made the handling system part of the critical path of the damage of the problem, project. So the next question, this is a, a, about keeping asking questions. The next question, why was it on the critical path? It's a baggage handling system. There's no other way to move the baggage. The system of carts and barcode readers and scanning devices and blah 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 was the only way to move the baggage from the uh, departures lounge yeah, to the airport. Uh, next question. Are there no alternative ways to move the baggage? <coughs> well there are. There's dirty guys and trolleys. <laughs> there's, there's lots of ways to move baggage. So why couldn't they use one of these alternative methods? Why couldn't they just have guys hand loading trolleys? Ah, the tunnels that were meant to serve the automated cart system were too low for people and too small for <laughs> trucks. Couldn't the tunnels have been redesigned? We well, yes, they could, but it would have been expensive early on. Here we're talking about technical assets. Couldn't it have started earlier? They knew it was on the critical path, so it could have been. Was the lateness of ABHS software seen as a potential risk? Only after it happened, before that, the software was placed on an aggressive schedule and managed for success. <laughs> Can do attitude. <laughs> Have software projects ever been late before? <laughs> they always work. Yeah. Solid. Yes, but this one was supposed to be different. <laughs> was there any history of prior projects similar to this? Yes, in Munich, the Joseph Strauss Airport installed one of these systems. Did the Denver team go to Munich? And what did they learn? They did visit Munich. The Munich software team had allowed full two years of testing and six months, 24 hour, hour operation to tune the system for cutover. They told the, uh, the Denver folk to allow that much or more. 
guess what's coming next? <laughs> Did the Denver management follow this advice? <laughs> Since there wasn't time for such extensive testing and tuning, they elected not to. <laughs> Did the project team give sufficient warning of impending labours? Now, this is where this really hits home. This example really hits home. It's uh, British Aerospace, their um, automated test systems. They actually declared that they would own, well, the DIA team put out the bidding, nobody bid. Eventually they sort of begged British Aerospace to do the job and they did it on an as-is basis. They said it's <coughs> impossible to fulfil it in the timeline, in their quote, when they started. We were already late when they started. Yeah. So, the, so eventually they, they engaged the AE to take on the project on a best efforts basis. During the project, the contractor asserted earlier and often that the delivery date was in jeopardy and the project was slipping further behind. With each month and each newly introduced change, all parties were made aware that they were trying to do a four-year project in two years and that such efforts don't usually come home on time. <laughs> <laughs> all of this evidence was ignored. So this is a software failure. It's not a software failure, it's a failure in just a man. A little game now, are we all awake? I can't see you, you're all fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming you are, you're all this. Okay, regarding software projects, I want people to, to call out potential risks to your deadline. Customers, one I haven't got personnel. Oh, no, so kind of. Oh, yes, I have. Beep. Changing requirements. Yeah, yeah. Beep. Unknown hardware. Hardware delay. Beep. Beep. <laughs> 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 now, I'm going to sound effects. I'll get a sound effect. Complex requirements. Oh, was that? Sorry. Sorry, fantasy requirements. In other words, just, just dreaming stuff. <laughs> in ill thought out, I guess ill... If you can tap that one, I'll, I'll put this one in just because I don't want to spend the rest of the life doing this. Um, so I've got one over there. Com complexity? Complexity? No. no. It's a good one. <laughs> I haven't thought of it. <laughs> person there, put that on the person there. Oh, actually, so other jobs in time was a perfect. You could put that on personnel. Um, good Budget. call. Who? Budget. Budgets. I'll put that under all things financial, but uh, you, you, there could be the several there that are quite important. First party. First party. I've got that one. I'll put that on there. Turnover in the project team. Put that on the person now, what I thought of the person now. External standards or... Uh, well, I've got intellectual property, you know? Yeah, that's right. Okay, no one's going to guess that. <laughs> Hooray! Okay, so one that hits us very often is unclear signatories. That's cost us an awful lot of money. Uh, weak project management, anyone? Yeah. And distance. Distance is a risk. Um, so... Fabiola mitigated it with her technique of deployment, but it's a risk. Boop. Bingo! Bingo! <laughs> <laughs> did you develop it in Lamy, by the way? I did. I couldn't do it in PowerPoint. The improvement in this is not very interesting. Slide, but it kind of allows you to group it into financial, organisational, technical, resource, communications. These are all the valid places to put risk. So we're going to do a case study here. I'm going to test your, your well, this is very early on, so hopefully you'll be really badly and get better for the next one. You might do really well. So it's a straightforward test system. This is an email from a new customer. It's a contractor working for a university. Straightforward test system may be they will supply some of the hardware we will be required to write the switching, the rack, the measurement, the hardware, and the lease. Test spec is attached. 
The unit under test is a power supply. Tests include loading and noise. This is a replacement for an old existing system. Needed as sap. As sap. We like sap. Yesterday is even better than this. Day. We need this yesterday. I tell you what, you can pay me two days before. <laughs> so, who's going to ask me some questions so we can work out what the risks are associated with this project? This is, these are fictional projects completely out of my head. I've never experienced anything like this. Before. <laughs> You, you have picked the hardest one. I didn't mind. That is... That bit us on the arse, not very my nice guy. <laughs> so yes, uh, what we have is an existing system, a unit under test, and a test spec based on the existing system. All the existing system. So, there's some questions there. Does the existing system work? Does the unit under test work? Do the people who make the unit under test know how the unit under test work? All risks that need to be. All questions we probably don't ask. Because you get good on this effect and get a hard one. Oh, I'm a candy guy. Okay. Is some of the hardware not supported by current like operating systems and so on? Will obsolescence? No, stand, reasonably standard hardware in this case. Have a time scale question now. What's the status of the test spec? Is it current? Is it... Test spec is current, yeah, but it's based on the existing system. Who's it been signed by the test spec? Ah, well, the, the, the signatories, not the test spec itself, the signatories for the projects will be four professors responsible for the testing. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Who's paying for it? The four professors or one of them? Well, the uh, contractor will be paying for it, paying for the project. We're working through the contract. So, why do they only supply some of the hardware? Just because it's specific to their skill set. It's a specific test that they would do that is. Uh, they have the IP off, everything else is standard. I'm sorry, I missed that. The test spec covers completely the test. That will be the, the sign off. Uh, okay, two more questions, and we'll, we'll actually go to the other one of these. Can I free to choose the remaining hardware? Oh, yeah, 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 it's up to us to design that. Where the four professors involved in creating the requirements? Yeah.
but <laughs> whether you can do it in, in beards. Uh, this one here is from a Steve McConnell way of doing stuff. So just traffic light. Um, this is what we use. It doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be that accurate, it just needs to give a feeling and be repeatable to a point. But if you look along this graph, you've got your risks and your mitigation. So we don't move on to mitigation. And there's a point where your mitigation costs as much as your risk, so you might as well not bother. It costs more than your risk, and probably not worth it. So there is, there is judgment to be had. Outcomes, bingo. Okay. So, what happens if we don't, if we just blunder into these risks? What are the possible outcomes? Failure of the project? Overrun. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Late delivery. Loss. Uh, I haven't actually got faith in what if I get Bankruptcy. Cost you money. Bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of reputation. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> there is no particular order, so you can't feel smoke. Uh, I'll put it failure, yes, so that can go under there. Uh, what's worse than cost to you? Yeah, man. <laughs> I'm not <here. laughs> No! <laughs> Cost of the customer. Damn it. Good <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, loss of business comes from cost of the customer. Now, I'm a pretty well up guy. And when projects go awry, I tend to suffer from that. It goes really awry, I tend to suffer from that. <laughs> and then you have little bits of nastiness like that. So, it, none of this is really good, you know? It's worth spending just a little bit of time thinking about it. Hold on. The other thing is, is, is Richard's writing all these down so we can list them and then we don't have to think about it. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Should have been shift, there's two keys. Where are we? <laughs> Play much yourselves for a while. Sure there must be a way to get it. Oh, I could have escaped out, can I? Oh Christ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? <laughs> Oh, it's just red. Sorry. Right, shit. Bank. Best artist in the world. Everyone should buy one of these. It's really expensive. One day I'll own his earth. So, good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. This is why I can. None, none of you kids can come and talk about this. This is why old kids like me can talk about this. This is the only corner that I've got left in the city, basically. So what we can do is we have another little game, isn't it? So what we can do about our risk is we can mitigate it. So this is our technical wealth leading into your technical debt. So mitigation is you are putting assets in place to solve the problem. Risk is a problem that hasn't happened yet. So, what can we do about those risks that we were talking about? Tell the customer about them. Okay. That's a good one. Good communication there. Identify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm going to this. Okay, I think I've been very specific here. Go on. Yeah, you can run, you can walk away. You can, you can really walk away. Um, 
this is quite a difficult one really because there's all the, the, the mitigation points are all in the head. So for the financial one, I was thinking you could to check the customer. <laughs> so first thing, if you're if you're on 30 days notice or you're on 30 60 days notice and the hardware is 20 grand, you're essentially giving a 60 grand loan to someone. Now if all you've got from them is an email, really you want to be giving people that amount of loan? The other thing you do is get the pay up front. Now, if requirements are uh, worrisome, you do the... One thing we always do in all our projects, and it's central to our business really, is actually two things. Um, so, we assume that if there is a risk, the worst place, looking at that graph, the worst place for you to have a risk turn into a problem is at the end of the project. And if you don't identify the risks and push them right to the front, then you're going to get that uncomfortable bit at the end. And we got stung fairly recently uh, on one like that. And it is much more painful at the end of a project than at the start. You are much more stupid. Um, I lost it. I like this one. Again, this is dealing with requirements type risk. Uh, I don't buy into everything at all, but I do buy into the smaller useful deliverables. You don't want four professors signing off your project. I've never known four professors agree about anything. <laughs> you want one signatory. Distance? Deployment. Uh, it's people who sign you off. They'll go as you say, you have finished. The ones you accept. Yeah, or the ones you do the test accept. Mm -hmm. uh, the primary, that's, you know our project plan, when we do the project plan, it's the second bit. It's who's signing off? Do we like him? <laughs> Does he know what he's doing? <laughs> Let's get that question out there and get it sorted. Uh, we do manual hardware screen, so before we even supply the system, we say, okay, Here's a few manual hardware screens. You can install power supply, you can a power supply, you've got a switch, you can press a switch. So I pity our customer name and wire it up and test all your wiring. Rather than coming in with your beautifully crafted system and find out all their wiring is cold. Uh, similar, for, similar prototypes. We always do a prototype because that's another way of kneeling out. And configurable systems I'll talk about in the middle, in a minute. Uh, can we have a few more from the audience? Now you've seen my bit because I don't think anyone's going to guess that. Um, so, this is why you should mitigate risk. It is a correct time. Now, you may think that this is specifically for you know, an hourly pay or even, not, even fixed price type like contract work. It's not. Because if you are working in a uh, company and you see these problems occurring, you'll at least be prepared and you'll look, when all four goes tits up, you'll look way better if you identify what the problems are going to be. And you'll look very much better if you actually have something in place to, to sort it out. So again, it's, it's worth thinking about. It's not purely for us contractor types. So there's your for three, four groups of things you can do. You can send them an eight or a voice, so you can just walk away from the job. And that's, that's all right. Some of the best jobs we've done we walked away from. <laughs> you can reduce or control. You can tolerate or accept. So tolerating and accepting is you're saying, I've identified the risk, we'll take it on the chin. So for, generally for us, it's, this is going to cost us a shit load of hours. We don't be able to spend some time. Uh, we don't tend to put our risk on the hardware, but we do tend to risk our software time. Uh, you transfer sharing, you say to the customer, well, you can't have this fixed price because you haven't identified everything you want. Therefore, you have to share some of the risk. Not all the risk, perhaps, but all some of it. So I'll show a few techniques that we use. 
So this is our requirements document. This is fairly new, and this, we do a thing called post-mortem at the end of a project. And it's, it's, got, it's got a preset set of embarrassing questions. Uh, we can't show our customer them because they're embarrassing questions about the customer and our relationship with them. But it feeds back into our process, and it's been one of the best things that we've done is actually at the end of a project, post-mortem, ask yourself these difficult questions, what went well, what went bad? Where things went well, where things went wrong. <laughs> but one of the things that came out of that were well, we weren't identifying the risks associated with the requirements up front. So we weren't making these educated decisions. So <laughs> now we started doing that. And, and the, the case is that if the risk of the requirement is four or five, then we can't do it at fixed price. We cannot quote fixed price. That's been quite useful. Normally when we do this, we both grade, I mean, uh, how likely it is to happen, and then we grade how, um, uh, how much impact would it have, have if it... Uh yeah, if you, if you dig through that book that I've said, that that's actually the correct way to do it, is you work out the actual risk cost, and that's based on probability, uh, and then that's divided by the, the total cost of the risk, and then you're supposed to add all of your risks together and do it like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a very good book. It's Tom DeMar everyone should read Tom DeMarco's books. He's, uh, he's very, very good. He's a risk, he, he's now a litigation consultant. Um, so they've seen <laughs> lots of software projects that have gone badly wrong. But he did people wear, which is an astonishingly good book. So using configuration to offline design decisions. So I had a customer that wants me to make an interlock, very simple. Where do you want me to make the interlock? Oh, I don't know. What relay do you want me to make the interlock? Oh, I don't know. So you can bash this back and forth and get that information from, oh, you just give them a screen, I don't do it myself. Mm. And that's, you have taken away all of that problem. Uh, and then you can carry on going and do other stuff. And this is always inherently better. Because where they don't know, they may change their minds. So, configuration. Offload your design decision onto the customer. Checking financials. In the UK, and I'm going to be interested in what, what you can do in Europe, you can do it as, for 15 quid, you can look up a company and you can ask them what their credit rating is. 15 quid. Nothing. You know, uh, 20 grand project or 20 grand worth of hardware that you're loaning them, you want to know that you can loan them stuff. Uh, so, it's available. Is there something like this in Europe? And America are generous. Personal credit, you can check if you have a, a, at least for a person, you can ask what is uh, the, the risk of, of being. Yeah, but there should, be a, there should be a company equivalent. And if, I, I think so. If you're dealing at, at the slightly higher level, yeah. it's well worth it. Sure. So, where the rubber meets the road? Pushing the risk forward. The best quality requirements feedback you get is when a customer is something to play with. When reality smacks them right in the face. And that's... I, I reckon we get... You get the requirements document. This is on average. That's probably 50% of your requirements. Give them a prototype. You get a few more. You get another 25% of your requirements. Make them use something. Even if it's only a, a part of it, Give them something to use, you know, if it's a test system, give them five of the tests. Then you start getting the last bit. And that's the agile bit is to, to that. Okay, we're doing a case study now. Now you're all in the license. <coughs> so this is a good existing customer. It's a large government agency, so there's no financial issues here. It's a compact distributed system, modular instrument, very expensive hardware, which they buy. Replaces the incumbent system. Costs that between two projects were promised to similar systems in the future. System failures are extremely expensive as it's a destructive test. Test all over the world might be skip. So what risks are associated when you're being asked to quote for this? Ah, 
perfect. And that's very personal to me. Yes, you need, if that is the case, you need to make sure that your quote is for two systems, not for one system divided by two projects. You have to say, this is the cost for the project, and it's for both. But if you, yeah, I'd, uh, yeah, customer bowl, I lost half the money I was supposed to earn, and I'm still committed to do the, uh, the other project. Um, the other things you have to look out for, so if it's very expensive hardware, and bless them, I, bless them, but if it's very expensive hardware, it's unlikely that anyone within NI has played with it. <laughs> Honestly, because they don't get, if it's a system of one scope, one rack, then they would have played with it. They don't get come through a scope of you know, a system of 15 racks with, you know, fully loaded with scopes and all the intended things. They just don't, because that's just too much hardware to keep around. It's, you know, it's, so, if it's a very expensive hardware, a very big system, be aware that you're likely to be the first person to have worked on that system for this life. It costs us. Okay, it's probably enough for that one, actually. How are we doing for time? It's probably whizzing through. Is that 15 minutes I've taken? Or 15 minutes back. <laughs> True events. So when your risk turns into a problem, sometimes there are warnings. But this is quite good because this is the trigger event of a tornado, I think. So this purple area is a type of cloud that happens. And that's going to suck the car up. <laughs> but when you, do, when you identify a risk, there are usually trigger events. So, for example, if you're working for a company that are on dodgy financial ground, suddenly your bills are going to start getting paid later and later, and the account guy is suddenly going to go missing, and all these unpleasant things start happening. These are trigger events, and that's when, at the earliest point, you have to bring in mitigation to that. If you leave it, it's going to cost you more and more and more to the point of disaster. Complicated factors, because I'm a complicated guy. So, you can mitigate a risk and create an avoid. So, for example, a customer on a job that you really want to do, it's a nice job, has future, it's got lots of good stuff, but they haven't got a very good set of requirements. So you say to them, how do you pay? Well, they haven't got a budget for how do you pay, they haven't got a project. So they go off and give it to a competitor who will take the risk. Because when you mitigate the risk, there is a chance of it creating a worse problem. So you have to use your judgment to say, how much do I want this job? You know, um, so, you know, for us, we take more risk if the job is interesting. We, we run a thing where, where we, we have a couple of projects that uh, are nice money earners and, and, and we take risks. <laughs> Um, if we like people, we take risks. <laughs> it sounds a bit hideous, but that's generally, generally the way we work. So it'd be nice to me. Right? Um, and as potential IP, that's the other thing. The project may come off with more potential than the actual starting point. So the, the IP is a very interesting carry-on for, for a risky project. We don't tend to take the risks if work is slow. Not that I can remember when work was slow, but... Um, yes, you always regret that because the moment you take a risk on a project when work is slow, a really good project comes along, you can't do it because you're doing this shit for a bit. <laughs> so, further study, I would, uh, I would take out the four factors, which is uh, Steve McConnell. Steve McConnell's a, he, he runs constructs now, he did code complete, he does these little video tutorials. This is a very good one he did for the ACM. And uh, he goes through four projects, each going from good to bad, no, bad to good, um, and, and how actually they were failures in judgment and not failures in people and the process and all that. So we concentrate on process, but it's far more to do with these factors than it is process. You know, anyone can write software any way they like, but 
if the project is a uh, Denver Airport, you buy it. <laughs> just, you're just never going to recover. It doesn't matter what you use, how you do it. And finally, you'll see me in an old week if you go to Austin, and I'll be doing that. This, uh, this map that I've written. Oh, I'll be doing it with my colleague who's worse than me. <laughs> and we'll be practicing our awkward two-man handoff. <laughs> That's a great question, John. <laughs> I'm sorry. I need to work out if I'm going to do that or not. I even had it in my head that I was going to sort of grade myself up and <laughs> walk inside the desert like a 1950s character. <laughs> so, that's so much. Any questions?